exciting place. I mean, really, we were right up there. I'd say probably in the top five cities in the country in terms of retailing. I mean, you, you look at the amount of square footage that we have downtown, 2.2 million square feet at Hudson's, 850,000 square feet at Crowley's, almost 300,000 square feet at Kearns. I mean, collectively, there was around 4 million square feet devoted to retail, which you could put three Somerset collections downtown and still not fill all of the space, which is, it blows young people's minds away because they have no conception of downtown shopping. They never have been in a large multi-floor department store. They've never been in a dime store. They've yeah. never been in a drug store <laughs> with, you know, a soda fountain. Um, so they, they don't have any of these remembrances. So it's really hard for them to fathom what we used to have. All they know is, you know, photographs and things that they see online. So, so we were really lucky to have all of that. And there were so many different factors through the years that sort of brought that down. I mean, the Monroe Street area, which used to be the old theater district, started sort of somewhat on a decline in the 1950s around Crowley's. And seedier stores started to come in. And of course, once those theaters closed, or they became burlesque, or as we used to call them, art houses <laughs> back then, uh, that area started to go down and cheaper stores started to move in. Uh, it's interesting because the, the first retail district in Detroit was along East Jefferson Avenue. And then that eventually moved up towards Campus Marshes. Now, uh, anybody remember Newcomb Endicott and Company? No. Which was a very fine department store, actually yeah. on a higher level than Hudson's. Yeah. And they started out in East Jefferson and then moved to the old Detroit Opera House on Campus Marshes. And then farther up Woodward later on. And it's interesting that Hudson's also started, you know, as a men's store in the old Opera House as well and then later moved up to Farmer and then to Woodward. But Newcombs ended up on Woodward at Grand River. And for, they just kept annexing and annexing. And then in the mid-20s, built a 12-story uh, L-shaped addition at Grand River and Woodward. And then, of course, Hudson's acquired them in 1927. Oh. Kept the Newcomb name for not quite a year or so. And then the store, of course, went out of business Hudson's demolished that building and then put up that big L-shaped addition with the tower that we all became familiar with. And um, a couple of years ago, I met some descendants of the Newcomb Endicott family that are still around. They're out near the Maple Theater, near uh, Telegraph and, and Maple. And they were telling me stories and showing me scrapbooks of a very cool magazine that they used to put out monthly for the store. And they had a very elaborate holiday display too where they would bring live reindeer down every year at the store for the children. And those reindeer actually grazed on farmland that's still out that way. So a lot of, lot of interesting stories like that. And of course, um, Crowley's actually evolved from another store, uh, Partridge and Blackwell, which actually built the store that we knew as Crowley's there at Farmer in Aggression Randolph. Um, that store went out of business, though, um, a year after the, the building opened. So that then became Crowley's, and of course remained Crowley's up until, as Mike told us, they closed in 1977. When did that Crowley's store, uh, when was that original building built? Was that was built uh, in the early 1900s. Because it was an interesting thing, the only thing I remember from that store is the fact that they had wooden, wooden escalators. Wooden escalators, yes. Oh, yep, yep, yep. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, That's right. And they still have some of the parts at CRC, don't they? At the Central Resource Center at the Historical Museum down at Fort Wayne? They're, they're, I think they I'm do. Sure they I don't do. know what they're cataloged yeah, under now. But um, I remember when I was working with Mary Ann there that parts of the wooden escalator were, did reside at Dunn Fort Wayne in one of the buildings at the yeah, Historical yeah, Museum. <laughs> So, um, yeah, lots of people remember those wooden escalators. And, of course, Crowley's had um, several restaurants, too. They had a lower-level restaurant in the basement level, and they also had a, a mezzanine level. And um, on display out there, Mike brought his cup, or mug, from Crowley's that uh, I had lunch at Crowley's that they used to With Santa. The <laughs> with, with Santa. Santa. <laughs> yeah, of course. I love that old It's great. You were... 
I was young. <laughs> so was Santa. Yeah. So was Santa then, yeah. And of course, Kearns was beloved for so many years to so many people. And Kearns, too, started out on the east side of downtown and then moved to, to Gratiot, and uh, just off of Woodward there. And they started adding building to building to building. And then in 1929, a large 10-story building opened. And then they still needed more space. And Bond Clothiers had built sort of an art modern building next to them. They were only taking a couple of floors, so Kearns then leased the basement and the upper floors of Bonds for expansion. So, and of course, Kearns lasted until 1959. The Kern family actually sold the store in 1957 uh, to Sowers, which was a department store a chain based in Buffalo. But it just didn't work, and they were more of a promotional store, and Kearns started to sort of go on a spiral down with you know lesser goods and things like that, and um, underwent yet another management and ownership change uh, in late 1958. A gentleman who had been with Winkleman's for a number of years bought the store and really then tried to bring it back up, but economics just weren't there for them. And so the store closed on December 23rd, 1959, and people were allowed in the building that night until midnight. And and then the building sort of, it was actually, that parcel was divided up into, oh gosh, several dozen parcels owned by 17 different parties, mm -hmm. which prevented the building from becoming anything else. And it sat there for a couple of years and then all of a sudden they needed some revenue. So they leased out the main floor to half a dozen smaller retailers, which stayed until about 1965 when the building was demolished. And then of course the Kern family donated the clock uh, initially to the Historical Museum, which had plans to, actually at one time there were plans to put it in front of the museum, where the, the plaza is now. Um, so it was in storage for a while, and then the, the Junior League of Detroit ended up restoring it, and then it went back up on the side of Hudson's in the right. 70s, yeah. Yeah. and stayed there until yeah. the building came down, then went back into storage again. And then Peter Carmanos, of CompuWare uh, had great memories of, of downtown shopping and currents and things and wanted that clock restored. So then he paid to have it restored, all the copper and everything, and then built that nice uh, marble and granite base that it sits on now and then put a nice plaque uh, on there so that people knew what it was, especially people who weren't familiar with, you know, Young meeting a loved one, you know, <laughs> under the clock at Kearns for lunch or whatever. So, and then some of our other great retailers were, of course, Kresge's which is a homegrown company right. here in Detroit. Uh, and it's interesting that uh, the Kresge's at State and Woodward, which was always store number one and also one of the largest Kresge stores, is, is actually reopening uh, later this month. Yeah. Um, the gentleman who put the Russell Bazaar together at the Russell Industrial Center, uh, Dennis Cafalinos, uh, has owned that building for a number of years. Um, so they've redone the whole main floor. They're working on the second floor and the lower level now. So they're going to be renting out it's like stalls for different retailers. And then they've put a brand new bar in on the main floor. It's called the Five and Dime Bar. Oh, and so great. there's a, um, an opening on April 30th from 4 to 8 oh, for the okay. public and the media. Is, is the stuff still the same in there or has it been all gutted? No, it's pretty well gutted. Yeah, he's trying to find large images and stuff, paper and all that, that he wants to blow up and put on the walls and stuff. Hmm. So, no, the, the escalators are still there that had been there for a long time that took you down to the old cafeteria. But uh, everything's been painted out white and they've built stalls and things like that in there, so. So a week from tomorrow? Mm-hmm. Okay, I'll have to go down. Yep, and then of course we had a large Woolworth. Woolworth was on Woodward for many, many years. And that was also one of the larger Woolworth stores in the chain. They merchandised on the lower level, the first floor, the second floor. Uh, and then for a number of years, they also had merchandise, uh, particularly home goods and furniture, on the 8th, the ninth, and the 10th floors, and Toyland. And that actually was in two buildings, a 10-story building and then a four-story building. Now, that's all been incorporated into the lofts at Merchants Row now. Um, they really haven't had much luck renting out the main floor for retail but there are a number of apartments on the upper floors. 
And of course, a lot of you were telling me about your remembrances earlier about some of the other stores, such as Winkleman's and Healy's and Rossick's, yes. Hughes and Hatcher, Himmelho, Himmelho. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Russian Tea Room, Russian Tea Room, Russian Tea, or maybe the Russian was it the Russian Bear maybe, which was in the old 20th Century Club. Yeah, what, it was right okay. United Shirt Distributors. And then Myers I worked part time at Capper yep. and Capper. Yeah. Capper and Capper. Capper and Capper. I, I have a box out there with a shirt that's oh, yeah. open. In the David Whitney building. Yeah. <laughs> and we've got a little, uh, Rob, I've got a little um, box out there, a little jewel box that the rings came in from Myers. Good. Yeah. It's really strange because where Meyer Treasure Chest Jewelers is at Grand River and Woodward, right across from where Hudson's was. That was their headquarters, all those upper floors. Oh, sure. And it's like cocooned. The woman that owns the building now runs uh, Eastern Wigs. Mm -hmm. And she needed help a couple of years ago at, with something. And then I said, no, can I go upstairs and nose around? And it was like they turned the key and walked away. Oh, Every no. single floor, a treasure no. trove. Like really? Uh, so, exactly. I, I don't know if we should be asking questions right now. Or is don't it okay. really, or, um, we have an intimate group. Well, uh, that Wright K building, um, is there some significant history to that? Because that's a pretty fancy, mm -hmm. it was a fancy building down there. And I remember somebody with a long name, a long Russian name, ended up in there. How about uh, Shravankowski? Was that their name? Yeah. yeah. And he, she, had, she owned the big uh, nine foot Beckstein and kept it at the David Whitney building. But, but oh. Well, it opened as Shravankowski's Temple of Music originally. Yeah, that's. Okay, but that before was before Wright, Wright K. K. Oh, before Wright. Then it was Wright K. Oh, I see. Well, wasn't it Gabriel Fitch well, involved in that one too? I think so. So the symphony conductor, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. From mm -hmm. Orchestra Hall. The guy, the guy that got the orchestra. Orchestra Hall built. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then there was Peggy. Yeah. Now Wright K. Also, uh, later on, uh, I'm sure some of you are familiar with uh, Haberman Fabrics and Royal Oak. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Toby owned that building. Her and her husband owned that building in the early 80s. And they opened up a house of fabrics on the first two floors. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But it just became so expensive to operate that the, she just couldn't mm -hmm. do it. And they had antiques in there for a while. Yep. I wrote a story about yeah. that. That's right, that's right. And that opened up like during one of the downtown Detroit Day uh, well, promotions, maybe, I think. Maybe 83 or something. Yeah. So uh, Toby and her husband were in there for a few years. Uh, and then it became a radio shack for a while. Uh, and then it was vacant again. And then for the last decade, it's just been one right after another, different nightclubs. Pure Detroit, oh, yeah. uh, the Candy Tangerine Room, uh, the apartment. Uh, it's just been one club after another. And now, unfortunately, the gentleman who last owned it, who was an architect, uh, had, the, had to foreclose on it. And the building went up for auction this past fall and nobody bid on it. Oh, no. uh, and then the nightclub was still operating on the main floor. They got mad when DTE cut the electricity. So then they went in there and trashed the place. Oh. And it's really very sad to see that the etched windows with the right K on it <clears throat> smashed. It oh. looks like somebody took a machine gun and just oh. went to every window. And then somebody broke into the back, so they've had to board up the side entrance. And then last week they were pumping water out of the basement. So, because that's one of our oldest buildings downtown. What about the, um, what's the theater that had the water tile? Well, the National? What is it? The oh, National? On Monroe? Yeah, what? Yeah, the National. Anything ever happening with that? No. The, uh, it's owned by a construction company and, and then another gentleman who, now, the original plan with the city, uh, and back when we had a um, oh, uh, cultural affairs department right. uh, in the city, uh, <laughs> they were working with an architect and then also James Wheeler, who lives in the university district. James has the largest collection of African-American film going all the way back to nitrate, stills, wow. posters, trinkets, you name it. Huge collection that's been at the Museum of Modern Art, uh, mu other museums around, around North America. Uh, he recently did a big show at the University of Texas in Austin, and uh, this year may be having a show at the Charles Wright. 
uh, that was going to become the home for that collection mm -hmm. and then a screening room in the theater and then there was going to be uh, an educational addition to the theater on the vacant lot next door. But it just got so tangled up with red tape with the city, it just never happened. Mm -hmm. The city owned the building at the time. They in turn sold it to two other uh, construction management firms who, they had great plans, but it's never happened. They did get a small $150,000 grant during Super Bowl to clean the facade, right. all that terracotta. They threw a few little blue Christmas lights around it, so it looked like something during Super Bowl. And then they put a wooden facade up and they boarded up where all the stained glass windows were. Well, since then, nothing. Uh, they poked a hole in the side, take some more debris out, but the windows have been open for at least two years now. So oh, it's, nice. it's really too bad. Now, all the original Poavic, when you came in the entrance, it was almost like going into a subway station because it had the, the vaulted ceiling. Oh, yeah. And then there were images that have all been stolen. Uh, the regular Poavic tile is there, which is sort of a, an amber color, and glazed. It's, it's beautiful. It's still all there, but all of the ornamentation that were like in the middle of each of the walls has all been ripped out by scavengers. Um, the seats are all gone. The city put a new roof on about a decade ago to prevent any more plaster from falling down. It's a sweet theater with a, a, you know, not a horribly large balcony. And it still has, from the burlesque days, um, in front of the stage, it's like a running area where the um, dancers used to play. <laughs> shall we say, <laughs> and it's all a uh, glass block and it's lit from below. Mm. That's all still there. Oh. So yeah. that's a, another, another very important, old building, 1911. The are all there. <laughs> that's right, yeah. that's right, yeah. Except the dancers. <laughs> Except the dancers. Yeah. Well, let's go back to so, retailing. Yeah. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Do you so, want to go ahead yeah, with well, that? Yeah, I've brought a couple of DVDs okay. too to help us bring back memories and, uh, and show us where we're going in the future. Right. Uh, this one is, uh, was produced corporately by Hudson. Some of you who worked there may have remembered this. This was right after Marshall Fields joined the family. There we go. Good. That's pretty good. Nice. Yeah.
Was 1969 and the merger with Dayton, was that the beginning of the end? Well, I, I wouldn't uh, call it no. the beginning of the end. Um, you know, both companies were very strong in their communities. Dayton's in Minneapolis, yeah. Hudson's in Detroit. And they had worked together for a number of years, and it was actually a perfect match because they were both... Nobody really could come close to the market share that they had in their markets. I mean, like here in Detroit, we had... Crowley's and Kearns and Federals and Wards and Sears and Pennies, but nobody came close. I mean, Hudson's biggest competitor, dollar-wise, was their own budget store. And the budget store in the first <coughs> basement, from a square footage standpoint, was roughly 125,000 square feet for selling, which is the size of, you know, like a smaller Myers or, or Walmart today. That was their biggest competition. And it was pretty much the same in Minneapolis, too. You had Powers and Sears and Pennies and one or two other stores, but they were both so dominant in their markets. And they were both very, very particular about uh, community involvement. You know, they both did, both stores did big auditorium shows, both stores did big holiday presentations. Um, Mr. Hudson himself was just very committed to the community. I mean, if it wasn't for him and some of his prodding to get things done, he was very instrumental in Harper Hospital, getting that started. Um, he helped get the land donated for the state fair. He was very instrumental in the beginnings of our YMCA here in town. And of course, they were one of the first retailers also to devote 5% of all pre-tax profits, went back into the communities in which they had stores. So in Michigan, I mean, whether it's Grand Rapids, Kalamazoo, Battle Creek, all of these communities were that ri much richer with the grants that they received from the store. And they, uh, Hudson's believed particularly in, in serving women's groups, children's groups, and arts and culture. That's where their real commitment was. And um, let me tell you, as somebody in the nonprofit sector, Everybody misses those grants today because it, not only did you get the grant, but you got the support from the company to the people. And, you know, if it was, like in our case, it was an opera, you got a statement stuffer that went out to two million church customers, you got signage in the stores, uh, you were on the back of receipts, uh, website, you know, things like that. So many other things that went with it. They sent people from the store down. Uh, I can remember we used to give away frangos, and it wasn't just tiny frangos, it was the big frango bars, and they would send boxes of them down with silver platters and white gloves to give out during intermission. And, wow. You know, that's all gone. That's <laughs> all gone. Yeah, sure. uh, uh, even Marshall Field, when it became Marshall Fields, there was still a lot of commitment, but uh, not to speak disparagingly about anybody, but uh, Macy's really does not, it, it's a chain. Mm -hmm. And the biggest grant you can get now is roughly $2,000. Mm. And the amount of time and paperwork that has to go into that, you, know, you have to ask yourself, is it worth it or not? So what they would rather do is have you come to their store when they have an event and they'll call it a nonprofit day and they want you to bring, you know, entertainment and 
giveaways and things like that in order to get your name out there. And then you sell little booklets for $5 and you can get a 20% discount, which really doesn't mean anything because it's 20% off every day now. <laughs> or you get a coupon in the mail every week, or, or an email from them every week with 20%. You know, J.L. Hudson is a bachelor, mm -hmm. and he was born in England. And on his first trip back to England, there was a flu and he died back in England. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Joseph Hudson, Jr. Uh, became president of the company uh, at age 29, the youngest person ever to run a major retail company. And he remained with the company up until 1982, a, a year before the downtown store closed. Mm -hmm. He's still active in the community, and still very active with the Hudson Weber Foundation. That's great. Uh, downtown, and still lives in Gross Point. Mm -hmm. And his brother, Gil. Mm -hmm. And uh, you might want to talk about, the Weber brothers were also very important to the company. They really propelled the company into what it became as we know it. Well, J.L. Hudson had both sisters and their families and Oscar Weber living with him at his house. I think on Edison, mm -hmm. Longfellow, wherever they were. Boston, Boston. Boston. Because that's where Edsel and Eleanor were married, November 1st, yes. 1960. That's right. His niece, his yeah. House. The Fords. And Richard, Richard Weber lived on Lakeshore. Lake yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there were four oh. Weber brothers. And, and they were from Ionia. They were nephews. Mm -hmm. They were nephews, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the nephews of Joe Hudson. El Eleanor Ford was. Well, her mother, yeah, yeah. her mother, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Her mother, uh, Eleanor Clay. No, uh, Joseph. Uh, what's your mother's name? Clay. It's Mrs. Clay was the niece, but uh, when when her father died, they moved in with with Uncle um, Joe Eliza. Hudson. Yeah. Thank you, Eliza Hudson. Clay. I'm so sorry, Eliza Clay. <laughs> yep. Thank you. And then Z. J. L. Hudson. His home was in Brush Park. <clears throat> Uh, earlier home, earlier. that's right, that's right. Yeah. On Alfred Street, that's restored now, right? Yeah. I don't know if that's his home or not. Oh, I think you, that you was. Probably know. Yeah, I'm sure it was that one, yeah. Okay. I, I have something. Um, there, there's a house on Lakeview near Perchable, you know, mm -hmm. with the whole brick. There's two, two houses together, and now it's all <coughs> one house, but that's where Oscar Weber had it, built that house. Or okay. his chauffeur and his landscape. Oh, no kidding. Oh, interesting. And I know their names, but I can't think of them right okay. now. And then, that's, that's something nobody ever. Interesting. Heard about. Oh. And then I think about 10 years ago, one of the Weber homes was actually a designer showcase yeah, house. Yeah, it was <laughs> On Weber Place, yeah. yeah. Yep, yep. Oscar yeah. Weber House. Oscar Weber House, yep. And there was Very good. a youth department in Hudson's. <laughs> Leonard Willoughby House. Yes, architect. yeah, the architect. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It was the one part you used to walk out of the main store and you went across the little alley, and yeah. then it was like the farmer's yeah, the farmer's yeah. store, and for a while there it was like a food hall. It was like yeah, a, yeah, it was a uh, marketplace. Marketplace, marketplace used there. to be and the wine. Yeah, yeah everything in the in the, gosh, it would have been in the seventies, uh, yeah. the late seventies. The main floor of the whole uh, Farmer Street building was redone. Because yeah. uh, everything that used to be on the 10th floor, this is when they started to downscale. Yeah. Everything on the 10th floor moved down to the main floor farmer building. And that's, that was really the birth of Marketplace. Marketplace, Marketplace right. Foods, and they had really cool banners hanging from the ceiling and stuff. Well, for a while, they even had, I, I remember correctly, sort of uh, um, dressed in aprons and stuff like, like at um, Harrods in England. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. With the, with the yeah. aprons, and I don't know if they had the straw voters. Another thing I heard from Bruce Ogden Peabody, her father was quite big at Hudson's, yeah. that whoever owned Harrods maybe 50, 60 years ago sent his son to Hudson's to be trained. Uh, hmm. wow. Very good. Oh. Oh. Wow. Very good. Uh, what does that say about customer yeah, service? Yeah, sure <laughs> they were supposed to have the best training in the country. You have a Channel 7. Yeah, that'll be the next one. Yeah. Um, so, so Hudson's and Dayton's combined in 1969 to become the Dayton Hudson Department Store Company, but still separate identities, mm -hmm. Dayton's and Hudson's. It wasn't until 1984 when the staffs really combined. And again, it was probably economics, um, you know, the cost of doing business. So um, 
the corporate headquarters moved from Detroit to Minneapolis. And correct me if I'm wrong, but we're, there were about 1,200 people mm -hmm. corporately yeah. in the downtown building. Right. And then that sort of withered yeah. down to about 250. And then by right. the time. It's the advertising and the merchandise is all in first. So you forget that. The, I'm sorry, when the store closed, there was still the administrative offices. Oh, yeah. Right. yeah there was still a lot right. of people in that well, building. I'm skipping, that's right. <laughs> Making yeah. decisions and purchasing here in our community. So it was 1959 that they merged? 69. 69. 69. 69. 69. Yeah. So, so when they moved, when did they close the downtown? Everything moved out in the late 80s well, or the mid 80s? The store closed in January 83. of 83, mm -hmm. and then the last apartments in the building were 19, late 1986. Wasn't it okay. credit, the last so. department that moved to Minneapolis? 86, okay. March of 86. Okay. And then they kept a minimal crew in the building until 90, 1990. Okay. Uh, you know, for air conditioning and heating and security and things like that, because they walled off the entrance to the store after it closed. They, they created a new lobby with a big security desk uh, on the Farmer Street side. Mm -hmm. And then the only elevator service was the service hall where there were like, I think there were eight elevators behind that big wide escalator on the Grand River end. Okay. And those went up to, I think those elevators went up to 21. 21. Yeah, there's mm -hmm. only a select yeah, because there were actually um, 32 levels in the building altogether, including the various mezzanines yeah. and the half floors, because there was like a 15 and a half floor, yeah. uh, and there was like a 21 and a half floor where the sign shop used to be, <laughs> um, and then yeah. merchandise and services for the public on 17 floors. So, um, How many four. Two for selling. Four. The first one was, you know, fashion and shoes, and the second basement was pretty much home goods and, and a cafeteria. Yeah. And then the third basement was uh, mostly uh, apparatus to keep the building open. And then fourth basement was an incinerator, and there were lots of conveyor belts for uh, packaging and things like that. So it was and deeper than the parking garage is on that property now. About the same. There are the four same. levels of underground yeah. parking yeah. there, but most of the time, they're not all open because yeah. the fourth level still floods. Oh, no kidding. So. <laughs> we had that tube system where if you, know, you yeah. wanted to make more money, you know, yeah. when you change in your register, yeah. you dropped it in the tube and you sat down. Yeah, yeah. 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 there's a couple of them couple out there. Same. Yeah, the tube system went from uh, the third basement because there were actually, yeah. at one time, there were uh, uh, several dozen yeah. women working in the third basement in the cash tube room. And all of that was still there. And there were 87 different terminals where the tubes all came down into this room from all the various floors. Because the tube system went all the way up to accounts payable on 17 16, or 16. 16 and 17. Was it you, Mike, that told me in the, it was it 53 or 54, right before Northland opened, that they did $150 million in that store the top year? Yeah, $150 million was uh, the peak. Yeah. $3, million, then, $3 million a week. And in, that's the mid, in, in the mid 50s. That's in 1950s cash. Yeah, yeah, yes, <laughs> yes, yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know if it would have been, well, $3 million a week is your big retail thing would have been. Well, Christmas, that's true. Like that's true. Years. Average is yeah. $3 million a week. Yeah. 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 And Average then that, uh, the last full year of operation of the downtown store, 19, calendar year 1982, that $150 million had dropped to $45 million. Yeah. But it was costing a fortune, $2 million plus, for heating and air conditioning. Elevators, things like that. So the dishwasher broke on the on 13th floor in the restaurant. <laughs> no, in the beauty salon on the 14th floor, and it was like two million dollars to fix it. Just oh, because the year. water flowed through the building. That was in 80, 79 or 80. Mm -hmm. that oh, but the real Santa always came down. That's yeah. right. right. Yeah. The real Santa. You'll see that in our next uh, video <laughs> coming up. Um, so 84, the com you know, the companies combined with the headquarters. Um, and then along about 1990, um, then Marshall Fields came into the mix. Uh, and of course, the company then became the Target Corporation. Mm -hmm. They renamed it because the profits were all coming from Target and were no longer coming from the department store division. Although I do have to give Target a hell of a lot of credit because they pumped a lot of money. They really believed in the department store business 
and everything was first class, great TV commercials, great yeah. marketing, and they, they gave it their darndest, but it just wasn't working. There was, just, you know, people are shopping differently today. And so in 2001, in another, yet another economic move to save money, they decided to rebrand the entire department store division under one name, and they felt that the strongest name was Marshall Fields. So in 2001, then both the Dayton name went away and the Hudson name went away. Everything became Fields. Still pumping a lot of money into the company, still losing a lot of money. Target was making lots of money. Mervyn's was a drain on profits, which they also owed. Uh, so in 2004, they decided to sell the company, and they sold it to May Company, which also owned a lot of department stores around the company, like May Company Cleveland, May Company Los Angeles, Robinsons, Los Angeles, Kaufman's, Pittsburgh, um, Sticks Bear, no, was it Sticks Bear? Yes, Sticks Bear. In St. Louis, a lot of stores around the country. May was a pretty good company. Lord and Taylor. Uh, yeah, they owned Lord and Taylor for a while. Right. Um, but that only lasted a year. It, it was crazy if you worked for the company because you had a very sophisticated computer system and inventory system with Target. And when May Company came in, they weren't nearly as up to date. So it was almost like going back a decade. And then and that only lasted a year. And then everybody had to learn yet another new system when Federated slash Macy's bought the company. So, so 2004, it was under the May Company banner, still named Fields. And then, of course, 2005, Macy's purchased the company and gradually started renaming everything Macy's. I had a laugh when that happened. When Marshall Fields in downtown Chicago, people started threatening not to go there because they were oh, dropping, exactly. they were dropping the yeah. name, and it's like, hey, they, they did it to us already. Yeah, yeah. 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 problem when you change the name of us. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's yeah. yeah. yeah that was funny. Right. Right. Yeah, and that group is still together. It's called KeepItFields.org. They still have a website, really? and they Keep still have boycotts of the store several times a year. Yeah. And there are banners and buttons and stuff like oh, that they'll give that's you. Funny. And then it's a beautiful story. Oh, Dayton, that's right, when they dropped yeah. the Dayton in. I do have to yep. say that Macy's hasn't really tinkered a whole lot with the State Street store. Uh, most of the Christmas traditions are still there, mm -hmm. um, the great tree and the walnut room. They've actually added some new shops and things like that. I mean, they're trying, but... It, the walnut tea room is still there? Yeah. Yeah, I love yeah. how they take, Macy's takes credit for the Franks. Yeah. 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 Although they don't, like see, boys, yeah, yeah, they don't seem to be promoting the Frangos as much as, much as when as it was Fields. Yeah. So, uh, this next uh, DVD is um, uh, when I did the exhibit at the Historical Museum on Hudson's. We, also, we actually did two different uh, videos to go along with it. We did one that played in the theater at the museum, and then we did one that Channel 7 wanted to do. And so we interviewed <coughs> a number of people at Channel 7, and then, uh, speaking of Santa, Paul was a sales rep that called on Hudson's, and he just happened to be at the museum that day. And so we said, hey, you want to be on camera? And he said, sure. So he's talking about Santa and the trains in this. Good. I hope you can hear it. Some of the people are a little... I hope it's loud enough. I'm sorry. Should have brought a separate speaker system.
Smith, Hinchman, and Grills uh, was the principal architect for all 11 buildings. <laughs> yeah. 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 Now, Maura, uh, her book has been delayed. She's had a lot of health issues since then. But we met Maura when we were in the building for a year putting the exhibit together. Um, the, as you probably remember, in the mid-90s, uh, it was pretty controversial. Uh, the city wanted to do something. Who owned the building? Well, a church said they owned it. Um, a Gross Point developer said he owned it. An architect in Oak Park said he had the deed to the building. And uh, Mayor Archer created the downtown partnership to sort of spur development downtown and get to the bottom of it. And so they very quietly created limited partnerships, different uh, LLCs, if you will, to sort of buy all these different parcels so that they could finally get their hands on the property and, and get security in there again because it had been unsecure ever since the, the Canadian owners had bought it and started stripping the building and people were living in the building. Um, so uh, I approached the partnership, uh, a friend of mine was working there and when it became apparent that the building was going to come down uh, and I told my friend, I said, Becky, you know, you can't just bring it down. We've got to document it. We've got to, you know, We've got to get things out of there. The museum would like to do an, a, an exhibit. And uh, finally, after a lot of meetings with Maud Lyon from the museum and um, uh, Larry Marantep, who was running the partnership at the time in the mayor's office, they decided, you know, this is going to be the best way to soften the blow for when we make the formal announcement that it's coming down. So uh, I'll never forget the first time we took the trustees from the museum into the building. Um, it was uh, the day after Thanksgiving and we had a snowstorm and there was all these drifts and stuff and the only way we could get in was the loading dock door on Farmer. And we could only get the door open about so high. So if you can imagine the trustees from the museum scurrying in on their bellies to get under the door to get into the building. And then by the time we got to the woodwork shops on the seventh floor, they'd had enough. They were tired, they didn't want to see anymore. Because it, it wasn't what they remembered. And the first time we took the partnership through, uh, of course, no, these people were relatively new to the community. None of them had ever been in the building because they had never shopped there. Right. And so they were afraid to go in without police and police dogs. So, so we took them to the various floors. And of course, I think we went to three and they'd had enough. So they really didn't get it. 
<laughs> so, <laughs> so for the next year, then I would go on Friday afternoons, get the keys to the loading dock door, and I had six volunteers from Wayne State with me, and so we, we photo documented the building for the Historical Museum, for the Burton Collection, and also for the National Building Museum at the Smithsonian. So, so it lives in terms of color photos, black and white photos, and slides. Yay. And then we went floor by floor, pulling everything we could out of the building that was still there that we felt would be relevant for the public for the exhibit, signage, documents, and things the like that. Fountains. The drinking fountains. The drinking fountains actually yeah. still live. Yeah. And that, that's a great segue into uh, the archives because there are 70 brass drinking fountains uh, at Target in Minneapolis. Oh my gosh. So, 70 of them. And the museum has two, which Target donated to the museum. Did the Hudson family get any? I don't know. They have two, one that restored it's in beautiful condition. One was stolen about a year ago. Oh no, I've seen both. Yeah, that was stolen. And so then I called Tony at Target and I said, there's been an unfortunate situation here. Uh, we not only lost a drinking fountain, but one of the brass nameplates from the building was also stolen. <laughs> so Target donated both. Uh, There's still a brass nameplate at Northland. Um, yes. As you go yes. into the store, as you go yeah, into the uh, Macy's, World yeah. War II. I couldn't believe that uh, when I saw that. Uh, plaque also is at Northland. Okay, still Outside on the store. Outside one of the entrances. Yep. It's at Macy's. Uh, I think on the north side, maybe. Where were those things stolen from? Um, they were in a. Yeah, Wayne. they were in a secured, secured, secured uh, mm -hmm. building down at Fort Wayne. Okay. Uh, they think it was an inside job. Yes, okay. that's it. Yes, it was an inside job. Because they knew, they knew where it was and they knew how to get in. Exactly. It was, it was, it it was actually in the building right next to where the flea market is. Mm. So, so, yeah, it wasn't one of the curators. I just want to clear that. Yeah. One of the uh, well, it was probably security. Somebody yeah, in security. Security or maintenance. Mm -hmm. yeah. over, uh, so you think it's melted yeah. down? So it's almost virtually everything it's from uh, the exhibit was stolen. So, mm -hmm. And unfortunately, they didn't let the police know for several weeks. So by the time, you know, it was probably melted down for a few bucks Scrap or whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. did, so, did the Hudson family get any of the drinks? Because I remember there was one. See, they she, were in Joe's children all wanted a drink. They had been in storage at Northland for a long time after downtown. Uh, and then when um, Target formally put together an archives, then everything was shipped to, well, initially to Chicago. Because Target Archives was housed on the entire 11th and 12th floors of the State Street Marshall Fields. That's how big it is for Dayton's, Hudson's, Marshall Fields, wow. and Mervyn's. But then when May Company bought the, bought the store, they knew that May was not a good steward of their own history and would probably dump everything. So before they... Uh, formally signed off on the sale, everything was moved to Minneapolis in a temperature controlled warehouse and then they also created a new archive at the downtown Dayton's, now Macy's, and then also last year created a brand new archive at the Target headquarters downtown Minneapolis. And they've spent a great deal of money putting everything in asset free boxes, folders, everything's been computerized. Wow. So wow. if you go into their internal system and say type in Hudson's, and you want American flag, and you scroll down to American flag, and all of a sudden, tons of things start popping up. Postcards, photos, documents, you name it. It's, it's really cool what they've done. And, so they've, and they have a full-time archivist, which not many companies have anymore. Yeah. Is there an exhibit to, available to the public in and, Minneapolis? Yeah, on the 12th floor of the downtown Minneapolis store, which is also a great place to visit because they haven't closed anything down yet. It's still 12 floors, and they still have a, a fancy restaurant called the Oak Grill yeah. on that floor. And right across from the restaurant is the archive, and they actually have restored uh, one of the Hudson's drinking fountains for that exhibit, as well as a brass uh, plate and some, several other things. Now, they did have also create, in 2001, uh, an archive for Somerset. Spent a great deal of money with all these fancy showcases and and uh, they restored a fountain for that store also. But unfortunately, um, that was only up for about a year. And then they moved it up to the third floor next to the beauty salon, so the public didn't even know it was there. And then when Macy's came along, it moved to the basement of Oakland. And now, it's in the what's left of it is in the employee lounge. Hmm. So. <laughs> Jeez. What about the 
the so, windows? The windows, uh, there were about 50 or 60 windows um, pulled out, the ones that could be salvaged because they were so brittle, uh, that were auctioned off at Dumashell. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And some were, some were a foot square and some of them were the whole window. The glass was brittle? Yeah. I've often wondered if glass or ceramics became more brittle with age. Because a lot of those windows were still wooden frames uh -huh. too. Now like on the mezzanine level, it was all cast iron, very, yeah. very detailed cast so iron last around the glass. So, so okay. yeah. but then sure. the Do you want to? Uh, it's fine. Yeah. It's up to you. Yeah. That, this yeah. one is not quite 10 minutes. Yeah, we've got one more for 10 minutes. Everybody sure. okay? Yeah. Okay, this one is, uh, this incorporates the, the, the archives of uh, Hudson Davis. There's a drinking phone right there, right? Yeah. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you. 
serving as icons for people since 1897. It actually was created by artists in Seattle, Washington, using three different styles of glass making, including slump, blown, and actually curved glass. And uh, it is all part of the most famous icon, the Great Clock. History is more than a tradition. It is more than a story. History lives and breathes. The exciting part of learning about our past is imagining where you can go get in the future. At Marshall Field, you make history happen. Now, are any of those archives still open to the public? Minneapolis and okay. the seventh floor of State Street okay. are still open. Okay, Somerset. Good. Somerset. Somerset is not. Oh, that's too bad. And of course, we're always looking for new items, oh. both for the museum, the historic museum, as well as uh, central archives. And some of the things that I've recently acquired, a, a uniform from the 13th floor dining rooms. Oh, my gosh. For a shirt from the warehouse. Oh, yeah. That's his name on it. A skirt worn by one of the elevator hostesses. In yeah. yeah. a journal that a department manager kept in the 1920s of everything that happened on that floor. Now, coming up in the future is a follow up to the book, Arcadia Publishing recently experimented and during the holidays had postcards created on Hudson's, which actually went over pretty well, which surprised them. So that has also spawned a calendar for 2010, which will be oversized, sepia in color. It was at the printers last week, so that will be at stores in a couple of weeks. Um, at Borders and um, Barnes & Noble, Amazon.com, or ArcadiaPublishing.com. And um, we're also negotiating right now to actually do a follow-up, a sequel, if you will, to this book on Hudson's. And there's a couple of other resources I wanted to tell you about that you're probably familiar with, and that's uh, if you want to learn more about retailing and department stores. This is probably the best thing that's come along in a long time. It's called Service and Style by Jan Whitaker. And uh, there's a lot on Hudson's in here as well as other department stores all around the country. She has a great, fun website called departmentstorehistory.net that's updated almost every day and she invites people to ask questions. And Hudson's comes up an awful lot of questions. So pass that around. And then there's also a book called On Target, which is the history of the Target Corporation, and there is a great deal on Hudson's in here also, and this is by Laura Rowley. Pass that around. And that is pretty much it for tonight. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> Oh, yes. 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 $85,000 should be allowed to shape it and others to do that. That's what I'll start with. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
near the Harbor Drive there. There's a lot of those stores that came out to Gross Point. You remember the men's clothing stores? Well, you had Jack Citron and Skolnick, but you also had um, uh, Higgins and Frank and Hickey's. Hickey's. Both, both of which came to Gross Point. And um, Walton Pierce. Well, were they downtown? They were on uh, Park Avenue oh, by the Women's uh, City yeah. Club. Yeah, sure. Yeah. 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 Okay, well that's all I like to do. Brooks Brothers? Well, Brooks said oh, they opened much later now. So. Uh, they're newcomers. Too. Best and Company? Yeah, Best and Company. Uh, I didn't know they were downtown. I guess they could go back. I think Peck and Peck. Yeah, Peck and Peck was down there somewhere. And of course, DJ Healy, which was the best friend. Well, again, by the way, I don't want to take those cookies home, so please have some cookies. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming. Good. Thank you very much.